Hi there, Daniel here. Hope you're doing very, very well today. Um, I have a reply to uh, both, of course, who's actually, actually his name is Richard, as well as um, to Nikki. I'm having a little bit of a slower internet here uh, where I'm recording today, which is in our, in our basement as we have guests. So hopefully everything will go smoothly. Though. No, so um, as always, uh, or <clears throat> not always, so as, I, as I sometimes like to point out to certain episodes, and nothing is medical advice here, just me sharing thoughts, and I hope uh, it will be helpful to anyone hearing this. Um, now, this is a comment to episode pod 34, uh, which I just called to Christine, Tony, and Derek. And here is what, of course, or I should say Richard again, uh, said. My new problem with sleep is I have adrenaline rushes at night. I'll get an I, I'll I'll get an anxious thought, and it just mi- takes me over. I'll get hypnic jerks, and I can feel the adrenaline pumping. I'll be up all night. It's not sleep apnea. It's accompanied by it's accompanied with specific anxious thoughts. What happens when I've had an anxious day? But it's something I can't relax enough during the day for. I can't really prepare for it. It's preventing me from working. Please help me. And to that, I just uh, basically just replied that I would I would say something about this on Monday, and then uh, and then uh, Richard replied again. He said, "Thank you. I saw when I finished the video you brought up the hypnic jerks and talking about hyperarousal. That's the thing. When I look into hyperarousal, it's more about PTSD. If it was PTSD for me, maybe I could pinpoint the traumatic experience and work with it. But for the last year, this seemed to almost come out of nowhere." I have dealt with chronic stress, depression, anxiety, but these adrenaline rushes are taking over my body, my sleep, my life. I'm trying self-soothing techniques, but nothing really seems to work. Epsom salt baths, meditation, timeouts, rest, etc. These help, but not to the point where it eliminates or stops the adrenaline rushes. The only thing I can do when I get like this is take trazodone on top of having benadryl to knock me out, and it's horrible. And then in a separate comment, also I got tested for cortisol that somehow was within normal range and I have had sleep apnea test. It was only mild, I've done other tests. My thyroid is fine, everything is fine with that. And then I just said again, I'll comment on all of this above on Monday. <clears throat> now, um, keep in mind I'm a, I'm a sleep specialist and I do know quite a bit about insomnia. And when I read this, a lot of what you're talking about may be more towards like, you know, anxiety uh, per se which i'm not a specialist in but i have definitely have some thoughts on that uh but as we all know so it's a lot of overlap between the two so first of all uh i i the, you're you're right where i was when <clears throat> when you wrote your first comment there richard um what i was what immediately came to my my mind is hyper arousal and it is very very common actually for people to pardon me again <coughs> It's very common for people to describe um, hypnic jerks, which is like, you know, a, a body jerking just as you're about to fall asleep or people feeling um, you this sudden, sudden, super strong, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry, energy burst, adrenaline rush, uh, and, and that the mind kind of kicks into this like turbo mode. Uh, and uh, other things are like twitches, tingling, um, what else? Like a lot of things are related to hyperarousal. So that hyperarousal is really the kind of underlying cause for so many things, including insomnia in itself. And um, a lot of times, particularly when people have these like hypnic jerks, um, it seems really, really bizarre. And it seems very, very unlikely that hyperarousal is the root cause. People often. If, if, if people often really, really want to find out what what is causing it, it must be something beyond me just being anxious or stressed. And uh, you know, again, like when you're worried about your health, like you should talk to your doctor. Of course. That said, um, uh, hyper arousal is, <clears throat> in my mind, but a, a very common cause for these types of things. And um, here's the thing: like uh, when it comes to hyper arousal, hypnic jerks, and like you know. Uh, th- these type of things, they're kind of like insomnia, they're kind of like a micro version of insomnia in itself. Meaning, the more we try to like make ourselves sleep and, and produce sleep, the more, you know, the insomnia resists. In fact, it becomes stronger because you're, you're giving it attention, you're thinking about it, you're trying to figure it out. That 
that more attention means that the insomnia uh, gets you know becomes a greater part of your life if you will and i think and i believe that it's the same thing with these uh these micro versions of of uh uh insomnia which the high which, which the for example the hypnic jerks are so i believe that the more you try to like get rid of them like the more you try to do epsom balance meditation time off rest the more attention they get and the stronger they become and and why is that well i i I think it is because um, essentially the more you think about a problem like the hyperarousal, the hypnic jerks and things like that, the, the more preoccupied you get, like the more time you spend thinking about them, like the stronger, like the bigger problem it becomes and then, and then actually they, they, the, the problem in itself becomes worse. So um, let's say just for argument's sake <coughs> um, that, that, um, that somebody has uh, hypnic jerks that really are hyper arousal uh, induced what should one do well if somebody has like really really strong anxiety then that's something you know that has to be addressed and I'm, I don't know exactly how to do that I'm reading a book actually right now on like general CBT and I'm starting to believe that CBT really could work for for I mean I, I know that it's it's used for PTSD for anxiety for depression all kinds of things and I, w- I always felt that maybe it's not so good for those, but it's really effective for insomnia. But the, the more I read about it, the more I start believing that it could really work for anything. So CBT for anxiety may be really something to look into for somebody with a strong kind of hyper arousal component. Um, I, I direct a lot of people lately to Talking Insomnia Number 12, the episode Talking Insomnia Number 12, really good, which goes over some techniques uh, for anxiety. And, uh, and I want to just add one more thing, which is... Um, you know, in your case, Richard, I don't, I don't know much about you. Um, I just have these comments here, and um, and I try to be really like very mindful of that when I do these replies. But uh, one thing that I do feel often is important to point out is that when it comes to insomnia, very many uh, feel that their situation is is very unique and unusual, and. Um, and from the inside perspective, I mean, it is, it is like there's, it's hard not to feel that way because what's happening to you is very hard to explain. But I feel that when somebody is able to take like, kind of like step out of that inside perspective, try to look at it from the outside and, and, and start seeing patterns, like start seeing like, you know what, it seems like other people have kind of similar things going on. Maybe um, my insomnia is hyperarousal driven. That to me often is a step in the right direction because when somebody feels that their insomnia is like really unusual and unique and special, then that leads one down the path of looking for a very unique and special type of treatment. And and if you don't, if this doesn't work, then you might look for this other thing. If that doesn't work, there must be something else. And you just kind of stuck in this in this in this uh, never-ending search for something that'll work. But when somebody is like, you know, I, I think, yeah, maybe my insomnia is not that unique in itself, then maybe these things like CBTI that works for other people will work for me and, in, in, and I can commit to that and really try it. I feel like that very often is a big step in the right direction. So um, I hope this is helpful, Richard. Uh, you know, please leave other comments uh, and I'll try my best to to um, answer those. And um with that said, let me see. I might have to. Oh no, here it is. Here's the other comment that I wanted to uh, make a reply to. So, pardon me again. I have to clear my throat again. <coughs> this is also a, a comment on the same episode, episode 34, and this is by Cold Proxy from three days ago. So let me read that. Um, thank you for your response. Okay, so Cold Proxy is either Christine, Tony, or Derek. It's not Derek. It's uh, it's either Christine or Tony then. Uh, okay, so thank you for your response. So less efforts and CBTI question mark. CBTI can, can be challenged. Oh, this, so this is Tony then. Uh, no, sorry, <laughs> this is Derek because Derek was talked to me about non-24. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, less sleep efforts and CBTI question mark. CBTI can be challenging for someone like me with non-24 sleep-wake disorder. Again, I appreciate you taking the time to help us out. And, um, and then I just said, yes, I, I believe that is the case. Uh, and, uh, and then Cole Proxy replied here, yes, but how do I do that with 
non-24. I don't have trouble going to sleep. I just wake up after six hours and I need more sleep. Okay, so I thought about this like on and off during the weekend uh, and and we you may have to leave another comment and we can uh, talk more about this, but uh, the way I understand non-24 is the following, like the, the classical, the kind of original uh, case, if you will, is somebody who's cortically blind, like somebody who has absolutely no, you know, um, perception of light. And without any perception of light, light, oftentimes, uh, you know, those cortically blind individuals couldn't really form any circadian rhythm, which then often manifested as a kind of shifting pattern where they would go to bed, let's say 11 p.m. and then wake up at you know, 6 a.m. one day and then go to bed like 12 and, and 12 and then um, and wake up 7 the following day and then go 1 to 8 and then and then like basically like drift across the entire 24-hour spectrum and in a way it's kind of like being on a longer it's kind of like being on a 25-hour cycle instead of a 24-hour cycle and I, I believe that's where the non-24 comes into play now for people with like that traditional classic non-24 um, what I've read is that it's not necessarily that difficult to um, to uh, uh, address. So for cortically blind people, studies show that if you give them melatonin at you know let's say you know 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. or so, they usually actually do fall into a rhythm. So that you know melatonin itself can become a zeitgeber. It can become that signal that it's that 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 it's time to sleep, and also not not beyond that, you know, being that being that anchor, like the, this one time point that sets the, uh, the schedule. And now, um, with that said, uh, I, um, I feel like if you have this like non 24 hour pattern, then uh, having like uh, fairly fixed wake up time should be actually a, a good thing. Uh, because again, you have this kind of very drifting pattern and more than anybody else, uh, it, it may be beneficial to actually have a pretty rigid wake up time. And, um, and, you know, a pardon if I'm ignorant here, but I, I think that, uh, if, if you don't have, if you have like a regular, like circadian rhythm, then, you know, you may be able to get away with being a little bit more lax when it comes to that if you don't have insomnia, et cetera. But if you have non-24, I believe that uh, having a fixed wake-up time would be like particularly uh, important. But that said, that said, let's say I, I misunderstood a lot about this and and it is, uh, let's say it's like, you know what, having like getting up at the same time every morning is gonna be impossible for me. And by the way, uh, somebody with shift work just sort of asked me that question too. like. For her, like getting up at the same time is literally impossible because she was she was doing shift work. So she asked me, so what you know what? How can I get better using CBTI? Well, here's the thing, and I think I did. I kind of commented on that in in my reply to uh, to Cold Proxy, but I'll go over it again. Here is that a lot of people almost equate CBTI with what's unfortunately called sleep restriction, what I call bedtime restriction, which is like having a fixed wake up time and not spending more than typically like six or six and a half or something like that hours in bed. But the, the more I've uh, studied this and interacted with people and learned, et cetera, I believe that the behavioral, uh, the, the, sorry, the C, the, com the con uh, cognitive portion is, is more important than the, the behavioral therapy uh, component. Meaning, I believe that in, if somebody um, educates themselves about insomnia, uh, learns about sleep effort, uh, learns about um, uh, the 3P model, and, and just like learns, like really focuses on the C portion, uh, the educational portion, that is just as effective, maybe more effective than the behavioral therapy component. That said, like if somebody's spending like a really, really long time in bed every day, then it's very unlikely that you'll get better, but but I, I believe it can work. Like the cognitive portion is very important. And by the way, uh, there's a whole other school, which is called uh, ACT or acceptance commitment therapy, which is very similar to like mindfulness based therapy for insomnia. And for in that school, like, um, limiting time in bed is almost like a non thing like they say maybe you should do that maybe not but the, the focus is entirely on like um, 
the cognitive process of like uh, dealing with intrusive thoughts and like you know uh, accepting those thoughts and working with them, etc. So there are, there are many ways of getting past insomnia that that doesn't rely on you know changing your wake up time and your bedtime, etc. So um, I'm gonna end there and uh, hope this was helpful to you, uh, cold proxy, and um, and you know as always comments uh, are super super helpful and uh, with that said i'm gonna end this one and i'm actually gonna make a little video episode which is gonna be a response to uh dawn which i think is gonna be very very helpful so that said uh take care everyone and i uh, hope to talk to you again very soon Bye bye